Dragons in the Waters by Madeline Langle for A Strange Game of Bridge. By the third day at sea, the blankets were put away and the Caribbean sun was warm on winter white skin. The captain and the officers had changed from winter serge to summer whites. And Yan told the children that in the afternoon, the sailors would play would fill the pool. The pool was a large wooden box at the end of the promenade deck. It had a lining of heavy plastic and would be filled with ocean water by a large hose, which lay coiled like a boa constrictor aft of the deck. The pool was hardly big enough for swimming, but Yan said the crew enjoyed splashing about in it when the weather was hot and the passengers were welcome to use it too. The breeze was warm and moist. Dr. Eisenstein and Mrs. Smith still carried sweaters, but Simon, Polly, and Charles went to the dragon slayer dressed for summer. It seemed as though they had been at sea for weeks. They found it no trouble to keep themselves mostly in the dragon slayer, leaving the promenade deck for the adults. Which I think they actually appreciate, Polly decided. It's not that I don't like old people, Simon replied. But they aren't like Aunt Leonidas. But these aren't like Aunt Leonidas. But then I don't suppose anybody is like Aunt Leonidas. I keep saying Leonidas, it's Leonis. But I don't suppose anybody is like Aunt Leonis. <clears throat> Polly leaned against the box of oil well equipment. It's a wonder we aren't sick and tired of Aunt Leonis, but we aren't. We love her, she added swiftly. Reassured, Simon nodded. The sun was warming and comforting him. He pulled her all those fishermen's cap forward to keep the sun off his nose. What do you want to be when you grow up? He asked the two O'Keefe's. Charles countered. What do you want to be? A doctor. I haven't decided yet whether or not to be a people doctor or to go into research to stop heart attacks or cancer from ever happening. Then there'd be something else, Polly said. People do die. We have a lifespan, just like every other organism. It's supposed to be three school years and ten, Simon said. Yes, okay, I understand. You'll be a good doctor, Simon. I'll come to you, Charles said. I want to be a kind of people doctor myself. What kind? Well, I don't want to do research or be a psychiatrist. And I don't think I want to be a philosopher or a priest. Although my godfather is a priest, remember, Polly said. Charles continued thoughtfully as though she hadn't interrupted. I want to take care of all of a person body, mind, and spirit. It will probably mean getting several kinds of degrees, a medical one and maybe a theological one. I don't think much of church, Simon looked dour. Polly said, that's a lovely dream, Charles, but may I remind you how many years of school are involved? Charles smiled his slow, bright smile. Sometimes I'm glad I have an inherited mother's talent for math. I counted, I might never be, if I counted, I might never begin. But it's what I want to do and I plan to do it. He spoke with quiet conviction. Simon nodded and looked at Polly. What about you, Paul? I don't know yet. Not that I haven't thought about it. Our grandmother, mother's mother, is a bacteriologist and a biologist with two earned doctorates. She won the Nobel Prize when she isolated Frandeli within a mitochondrion. You expect me to understand what you're talking about? Simon asked. Not before you study cellular biology. I don't understand it very well myself. Anyhow, I don't think I want to be a cellular biologist or a chemist or anything. Mother's a whiz at math. Daddy says she could get a doctorate with both hands tied behind her back, but she just laughs and says she can't be bothered. It's only a piece of paper. I'm not sure what I want to be. You and Charles are lucky. I think you'll be marvelous. You'll be a marvelous doctor, Simon. But Simon scowled ferociously. What's the point of being a doctor if people die anyhow? If we find the cure for cancer and then people die of something else? Of course there's a point. You can care about people and about their lives. And you can help take away pain and stop people from being frightened. Of course there's a point. You have to be a doctor. If I can get scholarships, you'll get scholarships, Polly promised grandly. If you want something badly enough and aren't afraid to work, you can usually get it. I'll hold on to that thought, he sounded grave. I wish you were right. I'm always right, Polly said, 
and before the boys could pounce on her, she jumped up and ran across the deck. She's off to talk to Geraldo, Charles told Simon. Simon raised his left, eye, his left eyebrow. <clears throat> Geraldo is teaching her Dutch. Simon grinned. With a Spanish accent? His Dutch is probably pretty good. He's been on a Dutch ship since he was 12. Simon's smile vanished. He's not 12 now. No, but he's only 17 and Polly's 14 and Geraldo is, and Geraldo is the first male friend she's ever had who wasn't lots older. Why do you think she calls him Harold Angel? Because the G in Spanish sounds like an H. You don't think maybe she thinks he looks like an angel? He is extremely handsome. I hadn't noticed. Oh, come on, Simon. He has beautiful classic features and beautiful black hair and huge eyes with lashes so long they look funny on anybody except a Latin. I know Geraldo's not looking, Simon said, and he's offering two, not just Polly's. True, but it's different that it shouldn't be. Why shouldn't it be? Come on into this century, Simon. I'm not at all sure I like this century. Does your father feel the same way that you do? About what? This century? Polly and Geraldo. We haven't exactly discussed it, but Daddy was sharp. Uh, but Daddy has sharp eyes and ears, and his pheromones work as well as mine. Simon sighed. I suppose we could be Quentin Fair and Bolivar for a while, but I don't feel much like that right now. Let's go see if the pool is filled, and we'll pause there.